So it's all yours. I'm going to mute my mic unless I got any questions. Um, so you just let me know uh, when you want me to go forward. Okay. Sure. Well, first of all, welcome. Um, I'm Jabari Jackson, and I wanted to talk with everyone about a very um, important subject. And uh, this important subject is is college graduation. I think we've gotten to the point to where a lot of us have family members who have attended college, but the graduation numbers are not quite uh, where they need to be. So the the big the big um, question was: Could we or could we not have access to a college education. Now we have access to a college education, but the big roadblock is can we actually complete the degree? And there are several factors that come into play when we go into degree completion. And I just want to give everyone some things to think about. Uh, I would encourage everyone to have like a pad and a piece of paper as we go through this, um, so you can just write some things down and we want to kind of challenge your, your curiosity. Um, I believe in having a strategy for whatever you do, so this is a strategic plan and things to think about. Um, for instance, as you see this, preparing, planning, and completing a section of the slide, we, we're talking about do we have a relevant degree? And are you going to a school that's affordable to you? And affordability is based off of not necessarily the sticker price of the college. It is how much are you actually paying? What is your cost of, a, of attendance? Because some, some colleges offer uh, different, we call them coupons uh, for attendance. Then what are your goals, um, and, and are you planning? And we'll look at uh, graduation. Uh, we'll go to the the next slide. So <clears throat> here are some questions that, if you have a pen and piece of paper, um, I would like for you to just think about these questions. The first question is, why do I want to? Why do, why do I want to go to college? Why do, I, why do I want to graduate college? I would warn everyone that if you only want to graduate college because someone else told you to graduate college, uh, you probably won't uh, graduate college. It's, it, it's the harsh reality that one in every five uh, person that's eligible for some type of financial assistance to attend college, uh, one in five will actually graduate. Actually, it's less, less than one in five will actually graduate in six years. So it is always good to just start with why. Like, why uh, do I want to graduate? And as you start to think about that question, uh, Think about your values, your beliefs. As you think about that question, because if it's not valuable to you, if you don't believe in it, you will have difficulty really getting to the why. And the yeah, reason this is, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you. Somebody else just joined. I want to. I ask who it is, and then I also have a question on that one. Okay. Go ahead. Somebody just joined us? Okay. Yeah, they're, they're probably getting their audio together. Uh, but, but the why, um, sorry to interrupt, you know, just so we can have some mm -hmm. dialogue here. Um, yeah. Me, um, you know, I'm, I'm like I said, last week I just finished up my last course and did a presentation, and I still feel like I'm the same dude I was, um, you know, aside from a few deviations when I was a kid, just leaving the project, joining the military, setting out on my own. So I, I, I always felt that I was a good person. So 
my question is, so if, you, if you're already a good person, why would you want to go to college, um, you know? And that brought, brought me to, you know, that, that core underlying belief that, that I've found out so far, and, it, you know, it gives you an advantage. You know, at, at the end of the day, you know, if you had Shaq on your bench and you're trying to win a ball game, you had a disadvantage. You might want to put him in the game. And I, I don't know your thoughts on that. No, I, I think that that's a good thought, So. If if you have a piece of paper and you're writing things down, why do you want to go to college? For you, you believe it's an advantage. So I want to turn the question back on you. Why do you think having an advantage is valuable? Uh, for for me, um, I don't want to struggle. You know, um, I, I fear became a huge motivator for me. I remember growing up as a kid, and um, you know, you ever heard that saying, "Ends done ain't meeting." You know, it's here, here we are three or four days before the check come or for payday and ain't no food in the refrigerator, you know, or the, or the, the tank is almost on E in the car or we getting ready to go back to school and I don't have the money for the clothes and the shoes, you know, and that advantage, I, I, you know, to me is that, you know, I don't have to worry about uh, a salary that's sufficient to provide for me and my family anymore because now I have the skills and the uh, uh, education necessary to apply for that high-paying job versus that minimum wage job. Uh, I hope that answers that question. No, that's that's very good. Uh, as you're answering these questions, you, you, do you notice something that just came out of you as you were answering that question? No, I didn't notice. Could, could you... I'm not even in the room with you. I bet you started sitting up straight. Your body language changed. Your posture changed because that was important to you. Yeah, it, it did. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Why? Because and this is in this applies to whatever you do. But when we're talking about like college, we're talking about completing college. Your why? has to line up with your values and your lineups. You have to line up with your beliefs. And your beliefs should be something that you are passionate about. I'm going to take out a couple of words of what you just said. You said you wanted an, an, an advantage, and I asked you, why did you want an advantage? You said that you, you didn't want to be afraid anymore and you wanted some security. And then you said, if I have the proper salary, I have the security. So absolutely. So when we're talking about doing something and investing in something, the most important thing we can do first is like, why do I want to do this? So you, in asking me that question, you answered your own question. And I'm hoping that everyone is like thinking about as, as we talk about this, just right now, like, what are your values and what are your beliefs? One of my values is I don't want to have to steal from somebody, but I want to eat. I don't want to have to steal from somebody, but I want to eat. So I, I need some type of security, too. So security is important to me. Um, I'll give you another one of my values. I, 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 value, um, I value having faith. Not only faith in myself, not only faith in God, but having faith in a system that I can believe in. I know if there is not a, a system or a network of people that want me to be successful, and if I'm not a part of that network, I'm limiting access for my family members in the future. So that's my passion. You know, my passion is not to be able to walk around and say I have a degree. My passion is not to uh, be able to walk around and say that I'm smart. My passion is to be able to add some value and resources in the people around me. So we have to really, really just take some time out and say, why, why do I want to do this? Why do I, why do I want to complete college? For a lot of people, they're going to say, I want to go to college because uh, my forefathers weren't allowed to go to college. I mean, that's nice and everything, but it's going to need to be some more 
meat and potatoes than just that. So there's a lot of things that can go into that. The second question that, that you have to ask yourself is who else is involved? Like, who else was involved in the me going to college? So if you, in, in wherever you find yourself in life, there are other people involved in going to college. So we'll talk about the group that, that we always focus on. We always focus on our young people, those guys that are in high school now, getting ready to cross the threshold into the commencement ceremony of high school and the college. And, and we think that I am sending my daughter off to college. No, you're not. Everybody went to college when your daughter goes to college. Everybody went to college when your son goes to college. Everybody goes to college when you go to college. Everybody's going to college. And when I say that everybody's going to college, I'm saying that everybody is going to have to relook at their relationship with the individual that's going to college. Everybody involved. Yeah, Everybody I think that's involved. a that's profound uh, statement because, you know, we, we hear people, we show up to these uh, graduations and these uh, promotion ceremonies, and we see folks tear up and thank their family, you know. But for, for me, that's real because, you know, on a Saturday morning, instead of watching TV and playing video games with my son, I'm locked in the room reading through theorems and and codes, gradient descent, and all this, you know, fancy terminology where my son just want to play. And I have to, you know, uh, sadly, look him in his eyes and say, son, I don't have time right now until I get finished, and I'll be with you shortly. You know, so even though it was going through college, uh, he went through it with me, and my daughter and my wife too. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and, and that's good. That's a good uh message for the new paradigm because not only are are we sending our daughters and sons off to college, we're sending ourselves off to college. The adult learner is taking up a large chunk of the folks in college at brick and mortar institutions, at online institutions in the middle. So everybody's going going to college but for the just for the, the focus of, of of this group, we're going to talk about the young people that are going to college. I'm going to tell you uh, a condition that's in our families that we really have to look at. When a person goes to college, we as family members must do things. If we can add to the support of them going to college, do so. Most family members cannot. But the worst thing you can do as a family member is add to the stress of the person going to college. And I think you understand where I'm going with this. Um, and, and it's a very difficult thing. Um, let's look at someone uh, someone that has free lunch. If you have free lunch in school, you have free breakfast, you have free lunch, now you're going to college. And let's say you stay in mama house and you're going to college. If anybody knows anything about the summer bill for kids and how much they eat, could you imagine now you have an adult in the house? Now you have an adult in the house that's not eating one meal a day, you're eating three meals a day. That will directly impact the family. Who else is involved? When we look at uh, a child staying at home, are there uh, young family members who are not school age? Are we asking that member of the family to stay home and babysit the kids? These are things that we really have to consider as we think of who else is involved with this child, with this person going to college. Have we complicated our situation? You know, we can say, well, uh, nobody should have a baby or nobody should get pregnant and the baby shouldn't be here. But what if the baby's here? What are we doing? As a family, as a community, as a network of individuals, we have to all consider that. 
Yeah, you, you brought up a good point because a uh, true story, you know, I have relatives uh, on my wife's side who went off to college. They didn't stay home, but ended up coming back a year or two later pregnant, not able to continue. You know, th- this stuff happens. Yeah. And, and that's a life-altering event. It's like, do we look at that family member with disdain, or do, what do we do to uh, encourage the family member to stay in college? Those are, so when we look at um, college completion, we've got to get focused as far as, you know, teaching our young people about contraceptives. Um, a lot of times we want to make our young people to be robots well they're not robots and it's just realities and I, I, I'm a, a firm and, and adamant believer that young people should be educated on contraceptives educated on abstinence educated on all those uh, options available to them um, to prohibit them from falling in, into that trap. Do I say that having a baby is a death sentence? It's not, it's not a death sentence. It's not a death sentence. And I think a lot of times we think that if we tell somebody something when they are 10 years old, 12 years old, 14 years old, that they should have it already. Been in the military, anybody from military experience uh, would know that we get 18-year-olds that show up in the formation and they have no idea about this stuff that we just talked about. Young men that... Uh, Another thing I I wanted to, uh, you know, share another perspective on is that uh, deleterious influence because, you know, you know, a kid that's on track leaves and goes to college or the military at 18 or 19 years old. But that person who's already been in college uh, for three years might be 21, 22 years old, or if, even if it's the military, it could be in their 40s, for God's sake. You know, and then there are the professors, you know, there are some professors who have a, attraction to young girls. They're, you're legal in most states at 16 years old. So that influence when you're outside of home that you're free so to, to go and come as you please make your own decisions lots of things can happen and, and an old mentor uh, once told me that people go to college for a lot of things you know there's a huge market in college for sex drug sales all kinds of you know so it, it's a you know some might be going for an education some might be going to corner a market <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think the dangerous thing that we can do is think that our just because we've educated and equipped our kids that they don't need encouragement, consistent encouragement, uh, to avoid the dangers and to, to focus on the objective. That's why that first question of why do I wanna why do I want to? I left it at why do I want to? Because some people just want to go to college to say, I've been there, done that. Some people want to go to college uh, for those other second and tertiary reasons. Uh, the next big thing is, what am I willing to invest? What am I willing to invest? Uh, we hear this term, invest, and the first thing we think about is policy. As if dollars is the only investment that we're going to make. The second thing we, we, we think about is time, as if time is the only thing that we're going to invest. Um, college completion is a continuous investment. And when you're looking at college investment, a lot of folks have a tendency to say, I don't want to invest but so much into someone going to college. But it's 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 a lot more to it. And just for the sake of like 
sowing this seed that everyone needs to understand, like, how important it is. Well, I want to look at some priorities. Let's go to, uh, I want you guys to look at this next um, picture. So, um, you can go to that next slide. There we go. Okay. 1964 in New York. New York, 1964, New York, <laughs> 2014. Uh, we see the impact of inflation. We see the impact of inflation. And you look at how much gas was, and that's, that's a significant you know, increase. Look at how much a Ford Mustang would cost you and look at soda. So these are just just three things and many things, because there's a lot of articles that are out about how much it costs to go to college. There's a lot of uh, different perspectives on how expensive it is to go to college. Do I think college costs are expensive? I believe they are. Do I think we'll ever um, get the right price for college? I don't think we ever will. That's just a personal perspective. Um, I'm using a pragmatic approach to making sure that people understand this. Um, but that's I want you to push that button one time. And this is something that I want everyone to think about. Is how much are you willing to pay for your car? How much are you willing to pay for your car? How much to... Here's the thing about a car. If you buy a car, a brand new car, or a used car, the second it drives off the lot, a lot of you guys are completing my sentence because I know you are. We know it depreciates in value. The second we buy it, you buy a thousand dollars off. Second you drive it off the lot, it depreciates in value. A lot of us are more willing to invest. And cars, and we are willing to invest in ourselves. Those are those are things. As we look at our network, as we look at our community, as we look at those things, like how much are we willing to pay? How much are we willing to invest um, into our children's education? So are there conflicting um, areas of concern? Yes, there are. My goal here is not to tell anyone how to pay the cost. My goal here is not to tell anyone what they should value. My goal here is to let you all explore what you value and how much you value it, and then Look at the cause and effect based off the of decisions that that we make. Um, it's it's a very uh, emotional experience in the Jackson household because I have a 16 year old teenager that's getting ready to go to college. It's very emotional, particularly from Daddy, who's got to pay the investment for him to go to college. It's very emotional. It's it, it, it's personal and. A lot of these young people, particularly I could talk about my young person, does not get the importance of the disciplinary things that he has to do on a daily basis in order to graduate college. Not just attend, but in order to graduate. For the most part, uh, attendance of, of, of college has more to do with can you pay for college than are you smart enough to go to college. Did you go to the right college? Then are you smart enough to go to college? Did you have the right support system? Then are you smart enough to go to college? If you got two parents that graduated from college, guess what? More than likely you're going to graduate from college. If you're from a higher social economic background, guess what? You're going to graduate from college. There has been several studies about two uh, 
people with the same aptitude and test scores going to college, if you're from a lower social net economic background, the probability of you going to college is the same as someone who scored very poorly on that test that has a high social economic background. I am telling you that the college decision for the family, it's a family decision, is very, 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 very uh, difficult and it's a tough choice. And that question, how much are you willing to pay for your car? I got a lot of buddies that got some expensive cars. I'm not telling you not to have an expensive car. I'm, I'm just telling you that how much are you willing to invest in yourself or how much are you willing to invest in your child? How much are you willing to, to do whatever you're going to do as you make this decision to pay for college. And the comment that said it's a personal decision, that's the point I'm trying to drive home right now. It's a personal decision that we hope that people will think about this as they make those decisions. Okay, we'll and go to the... I got, I got a question, not to belabor this one, um, but that, that cost of a car... Um, you know, is it that is such a no-brainer for people to go ahead and spend the money for that car because that's instant gratification, and you're going to get that warm and fuzzy as you drive around looking good in this uh, brand-new automobile, whereas with college, you're paying probably for something that costs just as much as a car, but not only that, you're going to have to work. You're going to have to go through some hazing. You're going to have to learn, stay up late, and study. You know, is, is it that aspect also that, that will make, uh, you know, the, the car more attractive than the education? Yeah, that's a loaded question. <laughs> that, that's a loaded question. I, I think it, it's a, a conflation of the last, how many sessions? Like six sessions? You put all that together, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's all the, all the above. I think the the biggest piece as we talk about mentorship is if if you want to get someone to do something that they never did before. If, if you want to get someone to do something that they never did before, they got to start thinking differently. And it's it, it's a very tough thing. I'm gonna go back to that first uh, list of questions, I said, who else is going to college? <laughs> Everybody's going to college. Uh, you, when your child or you get that extra bit of, of money that we think is an overpayment check, it's not an overpayment check because you got a book coming up. you got a study abroad opportunity coming up. you got a study away opportunity coming up. And those are the things that are going to encourage you to motivate you. I'm going to give you all uh, another tidbit of information. Those folks that go to college that have a personal connection with their instructors are more likely to graduate than anybody else. If you have a personal connection with your instructors, you are more likely to graduate than anybody else. I'm going to give you some examples of things that facilitate a personal connection with your instructors. I'll give you a first-person example. When I was in college, we had a study away experience in New Orleans. It was shortly after the hurricanes in New Orleans. We did a study away in New Orleans. I became very intimate with two of my instructors. We developed not only a personal and professional relationship, but it encouraged me in my studies. If you if you were like just getting by and these type of opportunities present themselves, they're going to encourage uh, the completion of the degree. There's a, so there is a much higher graduation percentage of of folks that go to school if they have close relationships with their faculty. So as you're going to schools and you're, you're, you're talking 
about different campuses, you got to see if does your kid connect with the faculty? If you decide to go to school yourself, do you connect with the faculty? And those are like some some, some questions that, that, that you got to consider. And I'll be honest with you, if there's no, like, uh, the sense in between you and yourself, if there's no uh, struggle between you and the child as you guys are starting to shape and work through this decision, you're probably not coming up with a good, with a good plan. Um, progression is very painful. Thinking is painful. I know Gus talks about um, Martin Luther King's statement about thinking. What we're talking about is thinking, and a lot of times we, we, we become too quick to categorize, well, I know that already, so I'm good. I mean, knowing something and dealing with something is very, very difficult. Um, so which, which leads me to um, the hedgehog concept. Um, the hedgehog concept. So, the hedgehog concept was a uh, a, a concept developed by Jim Collins. He Collins, he's the author of the book Good and Great. He did an examination of a lot of uh, great companies and tried to, to figure out why did they have continued success. We're going to use the, the, the hedgehog concept to talk about uh, college. It's more of a strategic type of thing. Um, so finding out what is your big thing. You can apply this model to, to several things. But this is more of a strategy. This is like an a umbrella uh, type of a movement towards accomplishing something and sustaining um, a goal or sustaining achievement and sustaining uh, excellence. So if you think of these circles, if you look at the circles independently, um, I want to start off with uh, talent and passion. A lot of times you talk to a young person and you'll say to a young Gus, because I know Gus, or a young Jabari, because I know myself, hey, man, you can draw very well. You are very artistic. But is there a market for my artistry? Can I afford to go to that art school? You can say, well, you're a very good writer. Is there a market for me to start with? Can my family afford me to be out of work for the eight or nine years that it takes to start up for me to, to uh, provide a, a writing career? What is my talents? What am, what am I good at? What am I good at and is there a market for it? And then um, how much does it cost? And then when we do a, a cost analysis, is, is the juice worth the squeeze? So those are some like very important things as you look at what are, what are your talents, um, what 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 abilities do you have that that you can refine? Uh, was your was your GPA strong? Was your GPA strong because you had a weak academic uh, curriculum? Were your test scores high enough? I, I want to tell you all that there is a gap. There is a significant gap between the American black person, a Negro, or whatever you choose to call us, who are descendants of slaves. There is a gap in test scores. There is a significant gap. And then one of the problems that I've personally find with the education system is they want our children who can perform just as well as any other child to not have access to college because they didn't get a certain score. We 
who are aware of this gap must do everything that we can to prepare our students for the ACT test, for the SAT test, because there is a gap. And that gap has significant impact into how much or what your cost of attendance is going to be. And before, um, I'm going to pause for a second if anyone has any questions about anything I just covered. Yeah, I don't want to take up all the talking. I'll wait on some other folks to come up with some questions. But I, do, I do have Good a afternoon. question. Go ahead. Go ahead, Denise. Okay, so my quick question is, you spoke on SATs, ACTs, very briefly. My question is, what is the minimum score? What do most schools look for? And what is the gap between the privileged and the underprivileged, or the entitled and the African-American community? Okay, so the, the average gap was about four points between you being a black guy and you being a white person. Average gap in the score is about four points. In the state of Kentucky, uh, for most colleges, if you get a 21 on your, on your ACT, you can get in. If you get a 1300 on your SAT, you can get in. But that's all state dependent. That's why as we walk through this, you have to customize um, your hedgehog concept. And on the, so when you're looking at that, um, when we talk about the gap, um, if you you can Google gap, and it, it's a it's a well known thing in the education arena that if you're from certain socioeconomic backgrounds and certain ethnic backgrounds, uh, you tend to score low. One of the schools that I spent a lot of time. Um, working with, it's, as when you look at the socioeconomics, the black kids and the, uh, the, the white kids and the Asian kids, they're all um, on the same economic platform, yet the black kids score lower on the SATs and the standardized tests. It's not an economic thing, it's, it is just a cultural thing that that we have to uh, that that we have to address. It is it is one of the things that we must be aware of. That you know we have to do some extra stuff to help us understand language um, and the way it's used. For instance, I think uh, the best illustration I give you is I didn't I never knew what a what a medium was. I was 21 years old before I figured out what a medium was. And I'm talking about the median on the road. And so if those questions are introduced on a test, I don't care how uh, much or how intelligent you are, if you're not exposed to those words, you don't know what they mean. The first time I saw of a day, I was in Saddam Hussein's palace in Tikrit, Iraq. Never heard of a bidet. Have no idea what a, what, what a bidet is. And, they, and, and you get on these standardized tests, and they use statements that um, we're just unfamiliar with. Back back in the days, uh, in the 70s, there was an episode of Good Times where Michael was talking about cultural bias on standardized tests. And, you know, that's prevalent even more so today than it was back then, you know. And, you know, that's one of the situations where the people writing the test uh, just somehow cannot get outside of themselves and make a test that um, truly assesses the aptitude of the individual taking it, not necessarily the aptitude of the individual to fit within a certain uh, cultural norm or society, you know, because the hood is different from, you know, uh, the, the suburbs. And a, a lot of these tests are written by suburbia people, you know, so that's something we have to be mindful of, and we got to actually take time to sit down with our students and study. And I struggle with this for my daughter. I purposely uh, use words 
that we don't normally use within our daily uh, conversations. And if she says, what in the world are you talking about, I tell her, go get the dictionary. You know, and that's one, one strategy you can use, you know, by, by actually forcing them to get the dictionary and also applying that when they read. Because if you come across a word within a, a sentence or a paragraph that you don't understand when you're reading, stop, take the time, and look up that word because it's not something that you use every day within your household. Absolutely. Hey, can I say something? Uh, um, Absolutely. 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 Yeah, I, so um seen different systems from around the world. Uh, one of the things I, I did notice, uh, when we say black, I think we have to like uh, kind of divide that up in and uh, tease out the nuances of that. The African American scores lower. That group scores lower. Our Caribbean and African counterparts score higher than us, even though we have the language advantage. And so one of the things I've uh, kind of noticed what uh, African parents do um, abroad, not African parents within the US, but abroad, and, and Caribbean parents do, is that they treat the other cultures as a foreign language. And so they kind of address it to learn. It's a skill that they have to learn. And, and I think because of uh, uh, an American tendency not to necessarily learn a foreign language, we kind of approach subjects the same way. And so when they, uh, say a Caribbean uh, parent and, or an African parent, uh, run into the suburbia written language, they force their kids to acquire it as a second language. And, and what I notice with African Americans, we, nece- we don't necessarily approach suburbia from that standpoint. Uh, if we start looking at it as a second language acquisition, then we can bridge that gap. But if we kind of still reluctant on our approach to, to a separate culture, um, that gap is going to remain, um, and, that, and it's only going to spell more and more trouble for us. That, that's, that's powerful. I don't want to, uh, you know, derail Jack from uh, continuing on, but I will say that this comes along with, uh, you know, that cultural relativism, the same reason why you get so many people in the media upset because uh, George Zimmerman killed Trayvon Martin, and then you get so many people upset because George Zimmerman, uh, I'm sorry, because Trayvon Martin didn't listen to an adult. This points out a huge cultural relativism, whereas there are two rights and two wrongs. But, you know, it all depends on what culture you're from. And so that's something we definitely, as a mentorship organization, need to point out to the people that chime in and listen to uh, what we're putting out. we got to draw out the differences because there are a lot of times when the only uh, the distinguishing factor between right and wrong is where you come from. What well well stated. I mean, I'm I'm glad we got this on tape uh, <laughs> because all those comments are well stated. Um, Mayor, I want to um, restate some of the things that that you said and. Being aware of the nuances, um, I love the way you articulated that. I hinted at it earlier when I started talking about us Americans uh, that are called black or Negro or of, of, of slave descent, us from America. There's a big difference between us and the other groups that he's identified. I think one of the best uh, books that I've read that kind of uh, highlights that was a book called Disintegration. It talks about four blacks, four black Americas, and that group that he just um, talked about is a subset of what Black America is, and you know addressing uh, that skill as a as a uh, as a foreign language, that's beautiful syntax, and it, it, that syntax makes sense because 
I've personally taught myself um, that when I'm in different circles, I have to present myself different different ways. It's not that I've lost identification with myself. It's the fact that I'm communicating. And culturally, we have some cultural biases that we, we, we charge against ourselves that now he's acting like someone he's not. No, I'm, I am communicating because I'm trying to connect with this person because I need this person to do something. And so when we talk about, like, test scores, it can either be a gap that we, we can overcome incrementally or it can be a gap that can stop us, which leads me to something else that I want you all to think about, power statements. Amir talked about bridging the gap. One of my personal power statements when it comes to education is, I am bridging the gap so I can bridge the gap. It's one of my power statements. And power statements are things that as, as you start to encounter obstacles, you're able to state these things that, that kind of encourage you and help you maintain your mental focus, helps you point back to your why. Why do I want to be educated? Because I'm aware that there's a gap. and I'm aware that if I don't bridge the gap, I won't be in position to help bridge that. So, no, that was a, a beautiful segue. So the other two uh, circles about cost. So you got a price of attendance and you got a cost of attendance. Sometimes the price of attendance is less than the cost of attendance, depending on uh, what your package is, and sometimes the price of attendance is higher uh, than the cost of attendance, depending on uh, ancillary stuff. For instance, so a sticker price, let's just say uh, the sticker price for you attending college is uh, $400 a credit hour. So that's your sticker price, $400 a credit hour, and you're going to take 20 uh, credit hours, so you go 20 times 4, that's 800 bucks. So 800 bucks is the sticker price. But you know that you're going to need some books for those 20 credit hours. So you start with that 800 bucks for your, for your, for your sticker price, but you got to pay $300 worth of books. So let's add up. So now we're at $1,100. You got student fees so you can have access to all the facilities. That's $400. Then you got to pay that $1,500 cost because all freshmen got to live on campus, and we got to feed all y'all for for a semester. So that's you're gonna add $1,500 because because you got to eat. So right now we're at $3,000. Oh, by the way, uh, you got to pay um, your room and board. So now room and board that's another uh, $2,000. So quickly we went from, you know, a sticker price to room and board, blah, 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 blah. And we're already up right now. This this ballpark math, we're up to five thousand dollars. So when we start talking about the cost of attendance, it's how much the cost to attend college. And as a family, as you look at your hedgehog concept, when you're making a decision to attend the college, because some colleges on paper, when you see the sticker price, it seems like it's less expensive. But when you look at the cost of attendance, because you, because in your sticker price, room and board and other things might be, might be covered. So as you're making those decisions for your child, for cost of, of attendance, those are things that you should consider. Are there any questions about what I just covered? Okay. The, the, the next piece is like, as you're attending these colleges, you looked at the cost, you looked at your talent, and you, you, you're aware that um, does this college provide different 
uh, skills that are in demand? Is there a marketplace for the skills that the college that I'm uh, attending provides? Is, is there a marketplace for it? And that's very important as, as you begin to make your decisions because I'm going to tell you, most, most people who attend college will change their mind about their major between their freshman and sophomore year. Then they'll change their mind again between their sophomore and junior year. And it's, and it's good that we, if we know, I know engineering is a skill that's in demand, but if you're not uh, a strong mathematical student, Engineering might not be your course of action. You might be a very intelligent kid, but you can't stand the side of blood. So studying to be a surgeon might not be the best course of action, action for you. So as you look at those different courses of action, you have to look at all of them. What are my talents? What's the marketplace for my talents? How much does it cost me? Uh, to attend? How much does it cost me not only financially, but how much does it cost me in time? Do I enjoy what I'm doing? Did it go back to my why? Do I have passion for this? Why do I really want to do this? Do I want to do this so I can tweet on the Instagram that I graduated, or do I want to do this because I want to make a significant difference? So, what is my... Think, go ahead. Jack, I think that's a... Um a hugely important topic, you know, and we see it all the time, whether we have our eyes open to it or not within our community. You know, I know where I'm from, Savannah, you'll see a co continuing theme. Most people will graduate high school if they graduate, and they'll go on to uh, become a nurse, a school teacher, a longshoreman, or something within a uh, uh, beauty school, uh, a cosmetologist or something like that, or a barber or something like that, and or either go on to one of the factories or, or something or another. And, you know, this skill demand, you know, case in, yeah, case in point with the skill demand, um, you know, just like you mentioned earlier, I, I can draw all day long, you know, and most people who know me since a kid know that I can draw, but uh, who's going to pay me to do that? You know, and, and I like to look at McDonald's as, as a case in point. You know, you might be able to draw, but if you went and got a degree in art, you go, you're either going to be a teacher or you're going to be a starving artist. You know, it, it's just the bottom line. You know, but out at McDonald's, there's people walking in the door every single day, every hour on the hour, asking for burgers and fries. You know, you got to be able to feed yourself. So that skill and demand is something that I think as parents we should uh, sit down with our kids and talk to them about, not uh, to a point where you're telling them to give up on their passions or their talents, but letting them know that you can continue to keep this thing that you have as a passion, whether it be music, art, dance, or whatever, uh, but you can also take another skill and enhance that. And with, with that, i got a, one last question um, before I shut my mouth and let you go ahead. Uh, what do you feel about business degrees? Uh, me and my wife were talking about that earlier because most people – I know they'll say, if you want to get a college degree fast, go get you a degree in business or criminal justice. So how do you feel about that? And so we go back again. We go back again to our hedgehog concept. So if you want to get a, a, a business degree, it depends on where you're at. It would be nice to get a business degree if my family already owns a, a pizza shop. I mean, that makes a whole lot of sense. My family owns a pizza shop. Let's professionalize this pizza shop and let's see what we, what else we can do with it. But if I'm just getting a business degree and I'm not going to the proper school that has internship programs that's going to give me segue opportunities so I can get to where I can get that MBA and, and, and target in the right location, it might not be a, a, a good thing. So the worst thing you can do is not get a degree. <laughs> so, that's the, so that's the worst thing you can do. So, And I... And there's no absolute answer to any question. So if anyone says that you should not go to school and complete your degree, I think that's the worst, that's the worst decision uh, that you can make, particularly if somebody's going to pay for it. 
Hopefully I answered your question. Yeah, it did. All right. So we we talked about this this big thing. And I'm gonna tell you, that hedgehog concept, that is something that you gotta readdress and reevaluate until it sticks. And um you have to readdress it, just reevaluate it to a stick. I think there was a question that came across, but the way my, my data is set up, I'm not sure what the question says. If you can just read it off for me, Gus, I might be able to address it. Yeah, I have a question about uh, Sister Scott. She said, yeah. how many kids who are preparing for college has had a chance uh, to hear a career to, or, or have heard of career interest area assessments or interest uh, profiling? Very few. That's a good question. Do you know I spent the last, what, four months in my local area working with career coaches and career advisors, and I did some senior counseling outbreaks. These are seniors graduating from high school who had never had anybody do any type of assessment on as into what type of career that personality-wise they're best suited for, none of that stuff. They had never heard of a career coach. And even though in the school district that I was supporting, there are career coaches available. So uh, there are some very, very good assessments out there. Most colleges um, provide those assessments uh, to their students. And depending upon your school district, you can get access to them for free. I know in the state of Kentucky, you get a, uh, some various different uh, career assessment tools just by being a member of the state of Kentucky. And I believe most states have went in that direction, but we just don't know what we don't know. But that's, that's, that's a great question. Yeah, I want to get some links, um, if you have any, that we can publish to the uh, Facebook and Twitter and website. Uh, yeah. Website. So as we talk about customizing our plan, just just give me the five W's. What state are you from? <laughs> because each 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 state um, has different things. I can look up the state and, and get that information to you. Definitely. Okay. Um, so, but this hedgehog concept is something that that uh, I think Jim that that's very important. And Jim Collins did a good job in his book. I mean, he he, he took about. Uh, 70 pages of text to describe the hedgehog concept and how uh, different businesses came up with the hedgehog uh, concept. Okay. Yeah. When I saw it said Washington and North Carolina, okay, we'll get back uh, with you on that. Before we get off of this slide, something else. So if, if, if you have a military background and you are uh, the descendant of someone in the military, you're a parent and you're still on active duty and you have some GI Bill benefit left. That post 9-11 GI Bill is very powerful. It is a very, powerful, a very powerful tool to cover that thing called cost because it covers 100% tuition for your child because it, it allows your child to have BAH basic allowance for housing. They get a stipend just because they're your child. Now, it might cost you some extra time and service. Again, these are decisions that you have to make as individual uh, family members if you have uh, some type of uh, military experience. And uh, that was also a good question, say, if, if they're not on active duty. I'm not sure about how to transfer the benefit if you're not on active duty, um, you might still be able to transfer the benefit. My recommendation is if you are, if you have any type of military affiliation, that you go see a VA benefits advisor. Each school has some type of VA benefit advisor because that post 9-11 GI Bill is a very, very powerful thing, particularly um, if you didn't use any of that GI Bill, that's 36 months of education for your child. And most schools, uh, most of the public institutions have what they call the Yellow Ribbon Program, which is 
Say your child had 36 months of GI Bill, but instead of it taking 36 months to graduate, they needed another year. These schools pay that last year because you started off at that school with the same benefit that the GI Bill was paid. It's things like this that help augment the cost. That's not asking your child to sign up for the military. That's, that's your child receiving your benefit. If you are on active duty, if you're prior service, if you lost a loved one in the military, there are several benefits associated with that cost. Don't get so upset with the military that you don't get your entitlements associated with your loved one's service. I think uh, one of the most beautiful conversations I've had in the last uh, two months was I uh, was talking with a guy getting ready to retire very concerned about his daughter going to school. All he knew was he got the post-9-11 GI Bill benefit for his daughter. When he found out all the resources available to that, you can, you can hear the tears of joy. But we don't know what we don't know. So if you have any... Uh, benefit like that associated uh, with your service or your child's service or if they have a parent that's in the military, um, you can work with them to uh, get that done. And so um, I'm going to pause for a second if anyone has any questions about that. I thought of one All right. And a comment by uh, Ms. Scott that says if you're on active duty, you won't get the BAH stipend. Um, I don't know if there's any further questions. Well, no. If you're on active duty and you go to college, you won't get it. But your child, if, if you're on active duty and your child goes to college, they get it. That's the difference. So, if, But if you're that's the if spouse. You transfer those, those, that's if, if you transfer those months to them, right? Right. If you're the spouse, so the active duty soldier, if you're on active duty, you're an active duty soldier, you won't get the BAH benefits because you're already getting it. If you're on active duty and your spouse is going using your benefit, you won't get the benefit because you're already getting it. But if your child goes to school, that's a different story. They get the BAH benefit. Am I making sense? All right, so uh, looking at this, so you may find yourself or you may find your child um, somewhere along this path. You may find yourself or you may find your child somewhere along this path as you're talking through this. Uh, these are those critical um, years where you're making decision points. Uh, this is something that I, that you guys take away from this as you're working through your your stuff is like looking at what what needs to happen at these uh, critical junctures in time i encourage sophomores to take a sat or act to find out where they're at i, I encourage that I, I i strongly encourage that most times by the junior year you can get that that score the final score is when, whenever you take the final test. But uh, it's imperative to find out, like, um, what needs to happen. Let me tell you a big difference between what needs to happen uh, your junior year and your senior year. The hope is by your senior year, you have been accepted into various institutions so you can get to that point to how am I going to pay for college. For the most part, um, we don't we don't necessarily get there. But these are questions that if you find yourself or your child anywhere along this mark or the person that you're mentoring, these are things that you can talk to your children or the person that you're mentoring about about what needs to happen. There are different things that need to happen uh, for different people based off of the institution that you're going to, the availability of classes that you're going to, uh, there are several just different decisions that have to be made. I'll give you guys a, a, 
a story about a uh, uh, Carnegie. Carnegie was one of the, the richest men in, in America, and they had this uh, this life coach guru that came to visit him. And he told the the person, the man, this life coach guru. He said, "I'll give you a hundred thousand dollars if you give me one thing that um, is going to make me better at my business." He was trying to me. He said, "Well, I want you to examine what you're doing, and I want you to write out what's most important to you and how you're going to accomplish that." He gave him $100,000 on the spot. And after he uh, did all of that, he thanked him for his advice. A lot of times we know that there's a lot of things that are going on, but we fail to take that time out to really look at what am I trying to do and how, I, how am I going to get there? What am, I going, what am I trying to do and how am I going to get there? Um, this uh, concept that I'm showing you right now, the, the SMART concept, I think is one of the best um, tools that you can use um, for goal setting. It, it is a, a very, very powerful tool because it, it, it's simple. It's simple to follow um, as you are so you got your hedgehog concept, but you're still grinding and you're working through it. Now you got this uh, this smart tool, and this was um, the person who came up with the, the smart acronym was uh, Peter Drucker. Uh, he came up with smart concept. So he says like, and whatever you do, you want to be specific about it. It wants to be you want it to be measurable. Can you achieve it? Is it relevant to what you're trying to achieve? And then you got to put some timelines on it because you got to incrementally uh, get yourself to where you want to go. For instance, if you're talking about a test, you get people studying for an SAT, but they don't have a date for the SAT test. It's very, 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 very bad um, situation to be in is you've been studying for the test, but on the day of the test, um, you're not available because you didn't sign up the three months prior. As your kids, most states going into the junior year, they're going to have a test or whatever the state going to pay for it. As a parent, you want to get your kid to know when is that date. I'm going to give you a firsthand testimony that my knucklehead and me, we couldn't figure out when that date was, so now i got to go back and pay for the test again and find a date. So these are the type of things that you, you, you got to look at um, between that sophomore and junior year. And if your kid or you want to attend a particular uh, college and you find that the test score of your child does not make that child competitive, you want to get another, another, another shot at it, and then there are strategies to, towards that. If you can go uh, to the to the next um, slide. Okay, um, I'm gonna go to the next slide. And here, here's another thing with this one. I'm gonna make sure that I post this specific chart to the uh, site and also on the Facebook site. And I want you all uh, to download this, um, especially those who have a high schooler um, who's actually uh, within this timeline here. Download it and. Cut it up, do whatever you need to do, but take it with you uh, at the beginning of the school year when you talk to the guidance counselor. And I say when because you need to. Um, and have that guidance counselor at the school help you to mark some milestones, write them down on here, get those dates and whatnot. And notice, you know, that we have this thing charted out all the way through to graduation of college. And that's also to say that for these kids, um, and I call you a kid until you uh, graduated college, you're 26 years old, and you can take care of yourself. You know, until these kids are through it, we need to own that role as parents, you know, and see that they get through it because that's what uh, our contemporaries uh, are doing for their kids uh, out in society. So to put our kids at an advantage, we need to be that rock form. Even if we didn't get it ourselves, 
we need to see to it that they get it so that the next generation is, is better. Absolutely, because everybody's going to college. <laughs> so as we look at this, um, we're looking at, at, at a couple of things. If you guys can um, you take that SMART principle and you say to yourself, what task do I need to achieve was in that sophomore year, that junior year? What task do I, do I need to achieve? And what are the obstacles that are going to prohibit me from achieving that task? A lot of times we'll write down goals and we just say, this is just going to automatically happen because I wrote it down. you got to consider the obstacles. And as you write down the task, then you try to think, okay, what is the obstacle to achieving that task? And for each person, it's going to be different. For some people, you you might have just messed up your freshman and sophomore year, and the GPA thing is going to be insurmountable. So now you got to get a certain score if you're going to get access into that that college. For other ones, it's, it's, it's different things. Um, and we we kind of talked about paying for college. So as you're looking at these different tasks, you want to be specific about. Let's take. Uh, the ACT, uh, for instance. Okay, my goal for the ACT is to get a 24. I want to get a 24 on the ACT. Um, I have access to my local library, and they have these different pretests that that I can take. And like Brother Mayor said earlier, I'm learning a foreign language, so I am pra- I am practicing for the test. My teachers are also, they, our school gets points for how, how, how we score on the test. They're practicing for the test, too. So I took the pretest and I identified the areas that I'm weakest in. My public library has given me access so I can do different things to help me improve that score. If I'm a military child, I get tutor.com for free. When you go talk to your guidance counselors about what other assets does the district provide for SAT performance, you'll be surprised that the district will have coaches and stuff. It's going to cost you time. So you, as you're being specific, and you got to say, okay, is it measurable? How is it meaningful? Yep, this 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 thing is very meaningful because it's determining my success. Is it achievable? If I got a 19 on it, yeah, I think I, I, I can get four points in between my sophomore year and my junior year. Is it relevant? Yes, it's relevant. But if I've already reached the, the gate to get into and get into the college that the colleges that I want to to be in already, now my SAT score might not be meaningful. So it depends on where you're at in the process. Um, and then then it's got to be time bound. Am I going to take this SAT in enough time for the school to to view it so I can have access to whatever semester I want to enter into enrollment? So that's just an example. So as you look at your different tasks towards achieving your your goals, you just want to look at them and say, what's going to to to, to stop me? Um, and so for me. I look at it like this. This is it's all about getting your mind right, getting the proper attitude. Because um, those ABCs, you know, attitude, belief, commitment, and then destination. You know, my attitude determines my belief. My 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 belief models my commitment. My commitment makes sure I get to my destination. And, and Again, those are just different power statements that you come from within to help you get the way the way you need to go because you will be challenged somewhere. For some people, the SAT is a challenge. For other people, it's like resisting uh, going out to the party when they know you be studying for their test because everyone's going to have a challenge, but being able to go back to um, your, your your smart principles and and how am I achieving my goal? Are there any questions about this slide? Awesome. Um, and, and and here it is. You want it to be simple. You don't want some 
complicated thing because uh, as you're setting goals to, to hit that objective, you want to get just a little closer as you get closer to the objective. Um, but um, and you want you want to be measurable. You want to know why is it going to encourage you? Um, I know <laughs> when I'm out running with my wife. If you tell her uh, that we're going to run two light poles, that's all she want to run is two light poles. So get into those two light poles. She's going to be talking herself, you know, through that. Is it, is it achievable? And, like, let's just be honest. If, 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 the, if the college is not going to supplement the, the cost of attendance uh, for you and you're going to go on like $400,000 worth of debt and, and FAFSA uh, can't even cover to pay the cost of tuition, it might not be an achievable goal to go to Duke, I mean, or or Yale. I mean, I, I like to watch Duke basketball. I know a lot of Duke fans that didn't attend Duke, so you guys got to think of things like that. It, you know, is it relevant? Is it is it is it reasonable? How 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 are you going to uh, mark the scoreboard? And then you want to you want to make it uh, uh, time sensitive because uh, if you just let it like fester there, you won't necessarily get there. So, um, but th that's all I have uh, to cover. I'm I'm hoping that uh, I've encouraged some type of discussion. Uh, amongst the family members as they um, seek this challenging task. Any other questions for uh, Brother Jackson while we have him on the line? Okay, if you guys got any, uh, you know how we can reach each other. Uh, we're all online and we can all interface through our uh, group chat on Facebook. Um, and as always, I like to um, highlight somebody who I think is doing something in the community. So uh, this weekend we want to honor uh, uh, Brother Amin Hudson. And some of you might know this guy, um, but I met him uh, about five, six years back in Germany. And, I mean, he's just a completely positive individual, a father figure, you know, to his children and also out in the community. And not only uh, – is he uh, a good mentee, you know, because uh, he and I have talked, and I think he's given me way too much credit because as a mentor, you can tell somebody something, you can give them some advice, uh, but it's up to them to actually uh, go out and do the hard work to live it and do it every day. So all the credit goes to Amin. Uh, he's just been accepted uh, into Warren Officer Candidate School, uh, which has been a goal for his. And, you know, and to see somebody accomplish a goal, um, it's just such a, a beautiful thing, especially for such a, a guy who's such a, a good guy to his family and also out in the community. He's a football coach, and he's coached other sports, um, you know, throughout his uh, volunteer service to the community. So you can go on to the website and uh, read about uh, why we selected Amin Hudson as the mentor slash mentee of the quarter. And uh, if you see him out and about, just shake his hand and hope someone had a rub off. Uh, and uh, with that, we'll go ahead and close this thing out, and I'll turn off the cord because that's when you guys like to talk anyways. Uh, but uh, Brother Jackson talked a lot about um, From Good to Great by Jim Collins. So that's a good book to read if you want a more in-depth understanding of how some of these concepts can come together to uh fortify the likelihood that you or your child will be able to reach the end goal, which is to graduate, because a lot of people start, but not many people finish. So thank you guys for coming out. And when we post the link, share it with somebody and uh, go back and watch it again if you want to. And most importantly, print out that timeline slide and go down to the counselor at the beginning of the school year or at the end of the school year and sit down and have a candid conversation with them and, and have them to help you to come up with a realistic plan so that uh, your, your kid can be successful in pursuing higher education. So I'm going to close it out here and turn record off.